me know why are you participating in this course? What is what is interesting for you? What are your expectations? Because then we can, uh, after this short introduction, we can actually also start interacting with you. I mean, we will store the chat and the comments, the feedback. You can also respond to questions of someone else if you disagree or you agree with it. Um, because um, the, the first lecture of Mara will then be a video that will be played, but uh, so both of us can actually interact and can comment on 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 what you what you're saying. Because the idea is really to to make this an interactive course uh, as much as possible. Because we do have uh, Mara prepared some exercises in the upcoming courses, and I think it would be great to really uh, uh, see how how things are going. We plan to have a a longer course starting from September, but we didn't really have much time to prepare more than uh, these like, four sessions that are that are now foreseen. And I think in September we plan to have something a little bit longer, which will based will be based on on what we're doing right now. And I, I just wanted to go back in terms of the motivation of why do we actually need um, uh, explainability or interpretability? And when I go back to maybe 10, 15 years ago in like classical machine learning as a, like opposed to deep neural networks. Uh, most of the time features were handcrafted. So we modeled human knowledge that someone can understand. So quite often we worked a lot on texture and we modeled specific parts that are linked to, I don't know, lung texture, to tumors, et cetera. Uh, and, and then we modeled these features based on our knowledge. So we could understand some not necessarily in details, but somehow what it means. Also, when you look at distance measures like k nearest neighbors, but also like support vector machines to do classification, you sort of have an understanding based on known features of how it could work or would work. And the same thing for decision trees. I mean, if you have shallow decision trees, it's generally re reasonably easy to understand unless you have very, like really strange features that you extract. So quite often decision trees are also based on human knowledge and then you can actually make it something understandable. If you have very deep decision trees, that also might, uh, might go away. On the other hand, I mean, uh, deep neural networks have, most of the techniques have existed for a long time, but about 10, 12 years ago, it, it really started to become uh, uh, the, the, the technique of choice for most tasks that involve not only images, but also or text analysis. But deep neural networks, I mean, the, the deeper they are, the more parameters they often have. And the inner working really becomes a black box. It's very difficult to, uh, to, uh, uh, to actually interpret it. And, and also, you might have non-deterministic outcomes. So depending on how you train, how you start, how you initialize it, uh, you might get to, to, to different results. And that's also something that if we want to, if we have domains that are mission critical, uh, like we work in the medical field, for example, then we need to be able to at least somewhat make sure that, uh, that we know what the limits of the system are and how we can explain to a physician, for example, why we believe that something is like a benign or malignant cancer. And um, in clinical decision support, there's actually a lot of need for uh, AI support or decision support, because there's a this is a book called To Air is Human: Building a Safer Health System. That's about I think 20 years old now, and uh, but it analyzed systematically mistakes that were done in in clinical institutions. Much of it was done because people did not see the full information. People missed out some uh, because they had to take decisions very quickly. They missed out on allergies, on I don't know. Uh, uh, problems with medic with other medic interactions with other medications, and I think the report mentions that in the U.S., in hospitals, about 170,000 people die per year uh, for mi avoidable mistakes. That's why they said like our decision support is needed. So you need these tools. But then, if physicians are supposed to use them in in daily routine, we need to make sure that they understand the outcomes. So we're not replacing one type of mistake with another type of mistake. There's also a problem when we look at all of the different terms. I mean, I'd mentioned interpretability, explainability, but there's also like understandability. You can look at bias and reliability, robustness, uncertainty, confidence. Uh, I mean, accountability, that's what lawyers also talk about, or fairness or opacity as opposed to transparency. There's a lot of different views on uh, the terms of interpretability, explainability in the, the, in the world of uh, 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 artificial intelligence, particularly 
uh, to in, in, the, in the world of neural networks. And there's a, uh, I will make these slides available after, uh, after the course as well. So you can have the references and also the URLs. We organized the workshop where also we have presentations from different points of view on interpretability from a legal perspective. So the right to have some decisions based on your data to have them explained as well. Technical, so really from the AI researcher point of view, but then also philosophical, social, cognitive or ethical views on uh, interpretability. Because if you want to really look into more of the details of, of what it is, and if we want to define it properly, we actually need to have something that's relatively global to encompass the different views. So people actually understand the same thing when they uh, use uh, use about the, use the same uh, the same wording or when they use different words, but mean uh, maybe the same thing. And there's currently in the legal domain, there's a lot going on. There's the general data protection regulation uh, on the side of the European Union, for example, where they really push towards the, the right to have a, to know what, uh, what data is being stored on you, to have the data destroyed if you don't want a company to own the data anymore, but also to have a right on an explanation if decisions are based on your data using AI tools. And there's also an AI policy regulation that's currently being discussed that would even go a step further. And um, I mean, there are many definitions and different references. So this is a table that Mara generated that I will not explain because it's much too small to read anyways. But I want to give a few examples of what interpretability can be. So this is um, on, the, uh, on the upper right side. What you can see is sort of heat maps that highlight which regions are taken into account to, uh, uh, in, in the ways of, uh, of, of taking a decision. If a deep neural network takes a decision, uh, uh, specific regions of the image might be relevant for, for what is being done. And sometimes this is easy to interpret. So if you have a tumor or uh, a, a big lesion, if everything is inside the lesion, then you're sure that at least for the decision making, this was what the algorithm took into account. So it's good. Sometimes we looked at heat maps and actually the decisions were pretty good, but they were not at all in the organ that we wanted to analyze. So this is also something we can say like there's maybe a systematic bias somewhere actually helps us to get good decisions, seemingly good decisions, but it's also something that is maybe fragile and can break under uh, particular uh, conditions. And it's clear that in the medical field, it's mission critical. So you, you might have somebody dying if you take a wrong decision that is based on AI. And as physicians take the decision, the physicians are liable for the decision. Uh, if they use tools, we need to make sure that they can actually integrate that with their own knowledge. And I mean, other mission critical domains are self-driving cars. So if a self-driving car kills a pedestrian, something that happens with Uber, for example, then, um, I mean, you, you need to look at who's responsible, who's accountable for, for, for the problem with the AI algorithm. We need to look at how to find the problems and how to maybe make it better. There are also other domains where this is maybe not so critical. If you look at, I don't know, Spotify, giving you a song that you don't really like. I mean, it's maybe some, some randomness in some domains might actually be interesting because it might go beyond if you have always almost the same things, then it's get, maybe getting boring. So maybe it actually want to add some randomness to, to that as well. One of the things that Damara has based her work on is the work of Bain Keem on, on concept activation factors. So really the idea uh, of uh, looking at specific concepts here, for example, the stripes that are sort of characteristic for a zebra and how you can then explain uh, uh, the concept of a zebra with what is happening inside a deep neural network. And it's um, in the medical field, most of the time, we don't really have uh, 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 binary things only, like the detection of something, but often we have a regression task. So we have enlarged nuclei and histopathology imaging or uh, like, I don't know, irregular boundaries. So we really are looking at a regression task and that's how the idea of regression concept vectors was also born based on the ideas of uh, of Bain Kim. If you're more interested in it, I mean, there's uh, there's more in the in in the papers that uh, that are cited here. So this is pretty much um, the introduction that I had before we go uh, towards the video, which is uh, a more systematic approach. So this is really just a sort of some random uh, thoughts about it. Um, I would really like all of you, I will turn off my sharing and maybe you can all turn on the camera just for two minutes or so. So we can also take a picture of everybody who's present and uh, um, 
and then we can, uh, Mara can prepare starting the video and we can also start to, to, to comment on uh, everything that we find in the messages. And again, if, I will make the slides available so you have all of these links, but if you're interested in more information on AI for Media, you have the URL, you can contact me or also look at our web pages or uh, the page with our publications. Okay, and then I will I'll go back and stop the screen sharing. And we can have, a, have everybody turn on the cameras. Perfect, because like that we can, can have a better view of who, who's, who's there and uh, so how many people do I have? I'm not even sure how I, if I can make have all of them on screen. Yeah, I don't. I don't think we can visualize everyone at the same time. I can only see like nine nine squares. But just in any case, I think it's nice to see each other's faces, and it helps uh, understanding like a bit uh, yep. who we're talking to and who you will also be interacting with. And the idea, as Henning was saying, is really to have an interactive course where we try to um, to share opinions, to to share approaches, to understand and to learn from each other, and also to to put something solid, I mean, some, some basis where we can all cooperate together. Um, so yeah, it's really like, as I was saying before, we, we're really trying to to have a smaller number of people maybe but that we can follow in a better way and so don't hesitate to ask questions and to to write in the chat or to write in emails or in the group um, you will see that there will be some assignments where you will you can interact with other people and you can get it's it's a way of getting to learn better so if you really want to learn i think the, the first way is really to get to know what other people think about and how they understand the things. And if there's something that is not clear, well, that's where you have to go maybe to look first. So cool. Perfect. Thank you <laughs> very much for sharing your faces like that. We get a <laughs> bit of a view of who is, who is present. And, uh, and, uh, and then Mara, I will turn yeah. off my video now as well. And like that, you can share your video and I'm, I'm looking forward to the course and also, don't hesitate to comment because, as, as I said, the idea is really for next year or for September this year to 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 prepare a longer course, uh, and and any feedback is is, is really very welcome.